So this is a podcast interview with out-of-body experience expert Graham Nichols. Are you listening? So this is a podcast interview with out-of-body experience expert Graham Nichols. My name is Timothy Schultz. I am the host of Lottery, Dreams, and Fortune. So Graham Nichols knows all about going out of body, out of body experience, leaving your body to see or experience something is very, very fascinating. In this interview, we got to discuss a precognitive experience where he witnessed a bombing in London that happened a few days prior to happening in real life, as well as what it's like to work with scientists who are studying this type of thing. You're gonna wanna listen to the end of the interview where we even got to discuss in his advice if you want to have an out-of-body experience. It's very, very fascinating. So without further ado, let's get to it. Here is my podcast interview with renowned out-of-body experience expert, Graham Nichols. So I'm here with Graham Nichols. He's an out-of-body experience expert and really, really a fascinating, fascinating person. Um, Graham, how are you today? I'm really good. Thank you. How are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for taking the time. No really, problem. really appreciate it. So there's so much that I want to get to and talk about today, but you are arguably a, a renowned expert in out-of-body experience. You have written two books. You work with the Ryan Institute. You have worked with scientists and people studying this type of thing. You can explain it better than I can, but leaving is it leaving your body to, to see other things. Yeah, possibly. I think the science is starting to lean towards maybe something along the lines of that our consciousness is interconnected and extended beyond the brain. So whether it's literally that we fully leave the body in some form like our consciousness uh exits the body or whether it's some kind of extension from the body in the same sense for example if you're using a computer and your computer is both connected to the internet and it's also in its own right a computer um self-contained i think that's analogous to something like what might be going on with our body experiences that we're we're able to send information out but at the same time, we still have our sense of self and our uh, our brain, our identity within our own bodies too. So how long have you been doing this and when was your first out-of-body experience? My first out-of-body experience was in 1987. So that gives some context of how long I've been doing it. Um, but I got more active and more engaged in doing it around 1990 that's when it really started to become something that i was kind of focused on so just over 30 years basically and what are some of the most striking out-of-body experiences that you have have had well there's probably quite a few i could i could reference but um probably being in the upper atmosphere of the earth is one that comes to mind seeing the kind of rotation of the earth and sort of hanging in on the edge of space essentially that was a really powerful experience on a more spiritual level maybe um, an experience i had where it was almost like i went to the core of the experience and started to connect in some way with with all of the kind of consciousness and it, it felt like all of the consciousness in the world all at once so it was a complete almost enlightenment like experience so that sort of is roughly what I was referencing when I was talking about the computer and the internet. It was literally like that, but instead of machines, it was connecting to the minds or the awareness, the consciousness of what felt like millions of people. So that was a, a really profound experience. And then also probably the, the most intense was probably the Soho precognitive experience that I had in the late 90s. Yeah, because that was a, for people that aren't familiar, there was a, a bombing in, in 1989 and, and you had an out of body experience. And I was reading this anyway and experienced, saw this happening before it happened. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was really challenging on a lot of levels. Um, the experience itself was probably the most intense in terms of the emotions and the, the physical experience of it. But then at the same time, it was also intense in terms of it really challenged me 
to understand how something like that could be possible. I still don't quite know how I would put it into a into some kind of category and fully understand what was going on. But yeah, I was standing um, on Old Compton Street where the bombing happened. I saw the explosion come out. I saw people running around, kind of the chaos that ensued. And then I felt this strong, like emotional wave hit me in the chest and I came back into my body. There were five other people or five of us total. And I explained that I'd seen this and I had this intuitive knowing that it was precognitive in some way as well, which was interesting. That had never happened before. I'd never felt anything precognitive or, but, but I just had a feeling, a strong feeling that this was something that was going to happen. And, uh, then it happened five days later on this, on that road, exactly as I'd seen it in the out of body experience. Wow. Was that? Chilling? Like, what did that feel like when you learned that, hey, I had this experience about this happening, and then you witness, you see in the news that it actually happened five days later? Yeah, I, I went through all kinds of emotions and thoughts on what it might mean. Um, in some ways, I think at the time I interpreted it almost like a like a warning, um, like not to go there in a way, because I think I had mm-hmm. been planning to go there for dinner with some friends to a, to a restaurant that I actually saw in the out of body experience. So Mm. I think that was partly why there was this Italian restaurant opposite the point that I was standing at when I saw everything happening. So yeah, in some ways I thought maybe it was some kind of uh, warning for me not to go there or some sense that I, you know, that I picked up on that I shouldn't go there or something like that. But on another level, I thought maybe it was my connection with London and my connection with that part of London um, because I spent a lot of time around that area. I'd worked there and things like that. So, so yeah, um, it was a, a real mixture of emotions and feelings about it, really. As well, it was just, it was so powerful because there was all, there were other people there when it happened. So it's like usually when you have an out of body experience, you're on your own. Um, and this was so unique because those other people were in the room when it happened. And, you know, I told them exactly what happened as I came out of the experience. So it was a, it sort of helped in a way for me not to kind of think, oh, maybe I, you know, just imagined it or something like that. The fact that there was this uh, other people involved as well. Mm. And I read that you wrote some of this in a diary as well. Yeah, I keep diaries of every experience I have pretty much since, since the nineties. So, so yeah, I wrote it down within a couple of hours. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. So how do you think that people can gain access to information before something happens? I've had some dreams about things before they've happened and I've met and heard of other people. You know, there's plenty of like this happens (laughs) and. Skeptics out there, some people will say it's coincidence, but for people like myself and people watching this that believe that it is possible that this does happen, how is this possible? Is everything on a timeline? Has everything already happened or how does, is that possible? Do you think? Um, I, it's a very difficult question to, to get into, but I, I tend to sit since that experience. I obviously looked a lot into those kinds of areas. I was involved in science on in terms of working with precognition with the Rhine Research Center that you mentioned earlier, but also with Rupert Sheldrake, who's a well-known parapsychologist and scientist in the UK. And I guess the the general thinking in that kind of area is that when you start to get down onto a quantum level, time doesn't operate in the way it does on a on a macro level. We tend to understand time in a very linear way because of the way we experience it as human beings. But I think what a lot of the research is suggesting is that time doesn't quite function like that. Obviously, there's the whole idea of space time and that there's a link between time and space. And so in that sense, that time can be uh, curved or, or, you know, impacted in some way. So there's even ideas now of things like retro causation that the causal effect of something can go backwards in time so we're getting into all kinds of interesting ideas within physics i don't claim to understand all of those kinds of ideas or get too deep into them but 
when I talk to physicists who are experts on those kinds of areas, you know, even people who've won the Nobel Prize, like Brian Josephson, who is a big supporter of psychic abilities and psi research, and he won the Nobel Prize for physics. So I think, you know, he knows what he's talking about when it comes to this kind of topic. And those kind of people are saying that, yes, this potentially could could happen you know but we don't we don't know exactly how and in, in what form but i think definitely there's good evidence for example the work of dean radin at the institute of noetic sciences he's done a lot of work with what he would call presentiment so it's a very small period of time just a matter of seconds but people often feel the future so it's not so much precognition where you're seeing or experiencing the future it's more of a, a feeling, like a gut feeling that we've probably all we've all uh, encountered at some point. So in his research, he's found that people do, in fact, have an experience of something before it happens a few seconds before. So you can set that up as an experiment. For example, they will show an emotional image a few seconds after a person has to make a selection. So they make a selection and then an image will be shown and it will either be something very neutral or it will be something very intense and emotional. And when it's the intense emotional image, there's often a reaction before a few seconds before the image is shown. Their emotional response starts to go up a few seconds before they're even aware of it. So it can even be done with eye responses, um, pupil dilations and things like this. So it does happen. People, people might not even be aware that they're doing it, but it, but it's there. Just a follow up question real quickly. What's your opinion of people that believe that they create reality through the subconscious mind? I mean, I, I tend to think that there's definitely something to the idea of steering reality. Um, I mean, fully creating it might be a bit of a big statement. I think we'd have to have a lot of evidence to, to get to conclude that, but there's definitely a long, history of the idea of steering or or kind of impacting reality in some way i mean that's the basis of magic or the basis of uh you know ideas it used to be called the law of manifestation in the 60s for example and then they changed it then the idea of the law of attraction and all these kinds of things so there's a there's a long history of this idea of impacting reality through some kind of alteration in consciousness by impacting the unconscious which then goes into something along the lines of the astral planes if you believe in that kind of thing and then that then manifests in reality it's a sort of uh, classic process with your out-of-body experiences what exactly happens from your in your perception when you go out of your body are you seeing your are you seeing your body are you a, a ball of light? Are you like what? How do you perceive that when that happens? I think all of that can happen. Um, one of the interesting things about out of body experiences is they're very varied. They don't always follow the exact same pattern. It is quite common that people will see their body. I do sometimes see my body, but it, that's become less and less common. Um, it, in my first intentionally induced out of body experience, I saw my body, but in the last five years, I can't think of the time that I have, for example, off the top of my head. As we develop, as our fears and our identification with being a physical body starts to reduce over time, then I think what often happens is the experience becomes less physical in its nature in, in a sort of obvious sense. So to give an example, you might, in the early experiences, you might come out of body be looking at your body and feel like you're an energy body floating above looking down that's a, a classic out of body experience but as the experience develops and unfolds you often lose this sense of an energy body or a second body it starts to become more like a traveling consciousness or sometimes a as you mentioned like a sphere of energy or a ball of energy light something like that so it can alter and change and some people never experience the body actually that's one of the sort of uh, i guess the cliches of the out-of-body experience people believe that there's always a body but actually 
60% of people don't experience a body. So it's actually not the most common way that an out of body experience will, will materialize. So our understanding is growing all the time. And there's the esoteric ideas that have been around for hundreds of years that are still quite strong. And then there's what we're starting to understand more with the science and the research and just literally asking people what they experience, that kind of stuff. I'm very curious what the science is saying about this. It's very fascinating. Before I get to that, what are the skeptics? Like, What do you say to someone that is completely skeptical that thinks that this is just fantasy? Well, I mean, I've done a lot of debates with skeptics and I'm, I'm very happy to talk to skeptics about it. Um, my my attitude is to follow the science i i you know it doesn't really bother me if someone's a true believer or a skeptic kind of thing i i tend to for me i tend to just look at what's happening with the experience and what the research is saying and, and go from there really the the thing is not so much with out of body experiences but with psi or psychic abilities we have a strong body of of evidence 130 well, 140 years almost now of, of evidence on that subject. And especially the research since the late nineties onwards is extremely well designed and extremely tight, double blind, sometimes triple blind, you know, re really, really well designed research. So I think we can say now that the, the evidence supports that. There's such a thing as non-local awareness, non-local perception. An out-of-body experience, I think, is the far end of that spectrum. It's it's kind of like you can maybe pick up on a particular sense. Let's say you hear something or you see something in a psychical sense. An out-of-body experience is like when all of those sensory, psychic sensory um, aspects all come together and you experience the whole thing in one holistic form. So, so in a way, I, I, that's how I see it. I, I see it kind of as a continuum. So it can start with just one sense and go through to a full spectrum of sensory experience, which is what an OBE would be. Hmm. First of all, how are they studying this type of thing and, and what is the science saying? Well, out-of-body experiences are very hard to study because the problem is the reliability of the experience. There's a lot of variation between OBEs. And also it's very hard to predict exactly when they're going to happen. Because although there's sort of stereotypes of this idea of everyone who does it, they do it at, at will. You hear that term a lot. Um, I don't actually think that's really the case. It's more you do it when the conditions are conducive for the experience and you're in the right state of, uh, mind and body. It's, it's creating those conditions and then the experience happens. So. Those elements have to be in place for the study of it. And then it has to be a high quality out of body experience when it does happen. I did a 14 week study with the Ryan Research Center where we had targets that were selected in the US. And I was at the time living in Estonia. So I was doing the trying to perceive the targets from Tallinn in Estonia that were set up for me in, in uh, the US. One study we did, we got positive results overall, statistically significant. And, and some of the, some of the targets were, you know, really, really accurate. So it's, it's not a hundred percent, but you know, if you, if you do these studies again and again and again, we find that overall the science is showing that people are able to perceive things in a non-local way, in some way. We don't know exactly how that's working, but. In some form, they, they can do it. And remote viewing is a, a structured form of clairvoyance, basically. That, so that's another, that's another tool that can be used to, to do this kind of thing. And when you say target, so that you're focusing on a certain location on the planet and then you're going there. In the study I did, it was, it was images, photographs in, uh, Trisoldi's research. Um, I think they were using small objects, which is actually good because there's a lot of evidence that small objects are some of the the easiest easiest things to see while in an out of body experience so why that is i don't know but it seems that if you go through a lot of for example the near death experience research you find that a lot of what people see when they're having a near death experience so an out of body experience is a part of a near death experience they come out of body and they see things in that state 
it's often a small three-dimensional object that they see. So I think that's uh, a good angle to go with with that kind of research. So I've met a couple people that have had near death experiences, you know, where they literally died for a few minutes and then they their consciousness lived on and they they experienced these various things. Everyone is different, but how does that compare to an out of body experience? Well, I think an out of body experience is a part of a near death experience. I think um, the near death state. Um, causes an out-of-body experience essentially so there's many ways that you can get to an out-of-body experience and a cardiac arrest is one of them it's not the ideal (laughs) it's not the way i would recommend but that's one of the ways that people will have an out-of-body experience and so i think because of the nature of it because the body is completely shut down obviously when they're having a cardiac arrest the depth of the out body experience that that comes from that is often far deeper than you would get from doing it from a sort of self hypnosis or kind of uh, trance state that you would induce in a normal way so i think that's why often the near death experience examples are very very powerful examples and there are a few distinct qualities they're not completely distinct but there is this idea of like going down a tunnel and things like that yeah and do you think that that is coming from your brain or do you think so for example when someone dies you're slightly lighter in weight they say anyway i mean you know more <laughs> than i do about this stuff but you know you weigh so many grams less if you yeah i, I think is, I is think your that, soul leaving like what, what i think that studies a little you know that was done a long time ago it was it was a bit primitive i, I i'm not sure we can really say that um that's the case i think it's more where it where it originates i think that in a in an out of body experience or a near death experience i think that you are functioning through some form of non-local consciousness or some form of independent consciousness. I actually prefer the term independent consciousness experience for an out-of-body experience. It's the term I coined for the more veridical or objective, evidential form of -of out-of-body experiences. So I call it an independent consciousness experience. So in those kinds of uh, situations, when there's a cardiac arrest, I think that's a strong case, obviously, for that that functioning is happening completely independently of the body. When you're having an out-of-body experience from a healthy state, I think there's probably a bit of both going on. If we go back to the computer analogy, I think it's like if we say, where is the internet happening? Is it happening in the computer or is it happening, you know, in the internet? And the, the answer is both. Because you, you know, that that information is going into the computer, is present in the computer. If you pulled the plug on, you know, a website, you would still have those images and things on the computer. So they, they exist in the computer. So in the brain. Um, but they also, if, if that computer was destroyed, they would still also exist on the internet. So it's, so I think what we're dealing with is kind of both that in some instances, Things are happening partly in, in the, in the brain and partly outside of the brain and, you know, vice versa. So I, I think that would be my way of thinking about it. That's how I tend to see it, it working. Um, I think it's a, it's a mixture. Mm. And do you believe in, in life after death that people go back to the, in this description, the, um, internet? <laughs> <laughs> Not literally, but. <laughs> Um, I, I, well, yeah, I think the evidence is very strong that, that there's a continuation of consciousness in some form. I don't know exactly what that form and how long it lasts, whether, you know, there's a a strong evidence, for example, for reincarnation or past life memory in children, for example. So does it stay out there or does it? you know, move into another body or does both happen depending on the way in which the person died? For example, a friend and colleague of mine who passed away recently called Erlander Haldson was one of the leading experts on uh, reincarnation or past life memory in children. He mentioned to me that children who have past life memories often describe a traumatic death or an unexpected death 
in in the previous life. So there's the possibility, for example, that children that have that experience, it's because maybe the the consciousness of the person who's occupying that body now has unresolved things that they are working through. So it could function on that way. So there's there's lots of basically I'm open to lots of possibilities on how it unfolds, but I think there's strong evidence that it that it does unfold in some form. That's very, very interesting. I have a general question because it was released a few years ago, this formerly top secret spy program where the USA and the USSR were spying on each other with people that were having out-of-body experiences. Is that correct? What's your understanding of that? Well, in the US, it was more controlled uh, clairvoyance. Um, They were using what's called remote viewing. Often the remote viewing is people get confused by what exactly it means. Really, it's a it's a, a protocol, a structured system of applying clairvoyance. So clairvoyance is seeing things at a distance. It, it's not just seeing, but for, for argument's sake, for the what I'm talking about, let's focus on seeing. So they will try to see something at a distance and they will use a protocol to do that. So it was developed, for example, that you would start off with a very simple thing like an ideogram, which is just like a squiggle. You just draw it on a piece of paper and then you would try to get a sense of the impressions of it, the shape of it. And that would give you information about the target, about the place you're trying to remote view, the place you're trying to perceive. So it wasn't really an out-of-body experience. It was more psychic impressions that are built up into a picture that can then be used for espionage purposes. The Soviet Union. It's very hard to know exactly what they were up to. There was a lot of, um, I think, intentional misinformation. I, I think they were trying to scare the US by putting videos of uh, people like uh, uh, Nina Palagina, I think her name was, um, who who was trying to sort of move objects. And the classic image, you, you can see videos online of her sort of moving thimbles and needles and scissors and things like that. Some people think this was intentional to scare the US and make them think that the Russians had things they didn't have. So some people think that they were faked videos. Others go with the the angle that the Soviet Union approach was more on whether you could assassinate someone, for example, with, with psychic ability and things like that. So they were less focused on espionage and more focused on assassination and things like that but but there's there's a lot of misinformation it's very hard to know exactly what what was going on during that era but the u.s information has been yeah ma- mostly released so remote viewing is pretty well established now and lots of people are practicing it and i've studied it and i've spoken at the international remote viewing association conference in the u.s met a few of the people involved in the original programs etc when you have been out of body, have you seen aliens? First of all, bef- before I go that, go there. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a loaded question. But do you stay here on this planet? Do you see other people? Do you see things as they are? What what happens? I I stay. I go on this level, this um, physical reality, and I also go into other levels but obviously the more you go into other levels it becomes more and more subjective and hard to know the reality or not of what you're experiencing so i tend to in my study and research of the subject i tend to focus on the physical experiences unless there's something in that non-physical experience that i can verify in some way so and i had an experience of a plane crash for example where i saw the people who were in the crash they were you know, I saw them passing over basically. And then I was able to verify that there was a crash on that day at that time, you know, in, in, it was in Norway, actually, it was on an island owned by Norway called Svalbard. So yeah, so I've had experiences where I've been on another level in this afterlife type environment, but then able to verify it because of the information that I get gleaned from that experience. So yeah, I, I like to focus on the experiences that have some evidential basis, but I have had experiences in space, not many, but I've had a few. 
but I haven't had anything with aliens, no. And the plane crash that you saw, what did you see and how were you able to verify that that had happened in real life? Well, on that particular experience, um, I found myself in a, I, I didn't intentionally go there. I just came out of body. And instead of being in a physical like environment, I was in a very misty. It was almost like being in standing in cloud almost. It was mist and cloud everywhere at around 150, 200 meters away. Um, which is interesting. It seems to be quite a consistent distance. It was also present in the Soho bombing experience that I was around that distance. It's almost like it's a safety distance almost, you know, I'm watching things from a distance. I, I was at this distance and there was this group of, I, I wrote in my diary about 150 people and it turned out, I think it was about when I looked at the information about the plane crash, it was 140 people, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So I was very close in my estimation of how many people. They were all kind of in a group. I I had this impression that they just passed very quickly. They were confused. They didn't seem to know exactly what was going on. I mm. perceived the life review of, of at least two of them. One man always sticks in my memory. He seemed to be struggling. He was sort of struggling with some memory or association with, I think, his father. I don't know that for mm. sure, but I saw these images of this very kind of leathery faced man who looked mm. like he'd worked outside his entire life and, you know, um, had that kind of feeling about him. And there, there seemed to be a struggle between the two of them. Mm. So he was going through this kind of life review and seemed to be struggling with it. But then some of the other people, I remember there was one that was, I think might have been a woman and she seemed to pass away very quickly she moved into the cloud like disappeared into the cloud very quickly she didn't seem to struggle with the life review and that kind of thing and then some of the others were they hadn't got to the point of any kind of life review or anything yet they were just kind of in in a state of confusion and, and things like this and um i came back to my body i didn't for sure, no, it was a plane crash, but I came back to my body and I was like, this, this is some kind of accident where, you know, a hundred and something people have, have died. I don't remember how long it was, but a little while later, there was a, a news report and it described this plane crash that had happened in Svalbard and that these people had died. And, and then when they announced when the crash had happened, it was the same time that I'd had, that I'd had the out of body experience. So everything fitted yeah. really. Although, um, the crash was in a Norwegian island. Uh, most of the people were from around Ukraine. And I, I had kind of seen them as being something like maybe Russian or, you know, that kind of region. So, so yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating. So you mentioned that they were doing a life review after they, you know, you saw them, some of them doing a life review. What is that? Well, within the literature of near-death experiences, people will often describe seeing their lives, their entire life, and going before their eyes. And they they sometimes encounter things that they struggled with in their lifetime, you know, or, or people that they struggled with, and they'll they'll work through that almost. It's almost like they kind of let go of these issues, and it feels like they need to let go of these issues before they can move on to the next stage in, in some way. And I, I didn't actually really know about this concept at the time of the experience, but um, I just saw it was just very strange because I was literally like almost like seeing like a, a bubble almost with thoughts and images and stuff from the, from these people. And it, and it seemed to be their lives kind of unraveling in, in, in some form in front of me. So yeah, later on, I came across the idea of a life review and then even later, like only maybe five years ago, I came across the idea of a shared death experience. So that's really what I, what I would call that now, where you, where someone living shares in the dying experience of, of someone else. So they, they see the death experience or the near death experience of someone else. So that's a, that's an area that Raymond Moody, for example, who wrote the original book on near death experience, uh, life after life. Um, He's now looking at the area of shared death experiences. So, yeah, it's another fascinating area. Mm, that is fascinating. And you have written two books yourself, Navigating the Out-of-Body Experience and Avenues of the Human Spirit. 
What are those and where can people find them? Avenues of the Human Spirit is my my personal sort of spiritual journey. It's uh, autobiographical. It's my journey up until about 10 years ago. So that's that's the kind of gist of that book and some of the spiritual insights that the experiences have given me. So it, it goes quite a lot beyond just out-of-body experiences, but it goes into non-violence and it goes into spiritual transformation and the interconnectedness of things. So it goes into a lot of different ideas uh, about spirituality and what the out-of-body experience can teach you and, and give you. And then navigating the out-of-body experience is my practical guide. Currently, that one is not available because there's a new edition of it coming out, the 10th anniversary edition, which will come out sometime in the new year. But if people want to get a copy of that, you can probably get it secondhand or it's available through my course. I have a digital version of it that goes with my video course. And we will put a link to all of that below if anyone wants to to check that out. The stereotypical image that a lot of people talk about, historically anyway, is the silver cord. Is that something that happens? So when people leave their body, they see a cord attaching them to their body. Is that something that actually happens? It's very rare. Um, it's something that's common in in sort of beliefs about the out of body experience. But again, in in research, it's it's very rarely reported. The highest level that it's ever been reported was in the region of about ten percent. Um, but in most studies, it's more like one to two percent of people will describe it. It's very it's very uncommonly reported, but it's something that's gone into the popular imagination related to out of body experiences. And are you ever afraid that you? I mean, I'm sure you're not now, but when you started, were you ever afraid that you wouldn't get back to your body? I can't say to be honest it was a, it was a big fear because uh, mm. from from my early experiences it was always more of a struggle to stay out longer. Mm. Um it was never difficult to get back it was always difficult to stay out. So in a way from my early experiences it was always the opposite reality was the case for me so I was trying to learn how to stay out longer and extend the experience. So yeah so I, I didn't didn't really have that kind of fear. I think maybe a fear that I did have was going too far away in the early experiences. So I remember probably for the first six months of experiences, I didn't even want to leave my bedroom. I was sort of, you know, did just didn't really want to go any further than that. And I remember it was quite a big step to actually go through the window. I, I literally floated through the window and it was almost the feeling was like when you put two magnets, the opposite ends to each other and they kind of push apart if you know that feeling mm -hmm. that's it was kind of like i had to kind of push through that to get mm -hmm. through the window and then i sort of drifted out into the street and that was the first time i really went further from my from my body but that was yeah that was uh, a big step it took yeah half a year to get to that point mm. and when you leave your body most of the time what are you seeing Oh, it, it really, it really depends. I, I tend to allow the experience to unfold now. So often I'll find myself in a really unexpected environment. I might be in on the other side of the world or I might be in a place that I know well, but maybe seeing it from a different angle or perceiving it in a different way or, or something like that. So, so yeah, it, 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 it really varies and, and sort of depends really what, what happens. And sometimes I have these, if I've been out in nature, for example, the whole day or like walking a lot or something like that, I will often find myself drawn back in, in the out-body experience. So I remember, for example, when I was living on the coast of England, I lived about 100 meters from the beach and I'd been out hiking the whole day along the coast and I came home completely exhausted. I think we walked 30 miles over hills and, and I came back and I was really exhausted and I laid down on my bed and that exhaustion just sort of triggered an out of body experience and I came out of body and, and I went straight out over, over the sea. And I just remember this really beautiful kind of journey just floating out over the sea, you know, just seeing the waves and the, the whole thing. So it's not always predictable what exactly will happen, but 
usually it's it's an amazing experience whatever it is even if it's very simple even if it's just like for example one one time i just looked at a flower in the out of body experience and it was like my whole perception went into the flower and i could see the sustenance and the light going you know up and down and affecting the plant like literally the life in the plant so that was very simple thing i'm just looking at a flower but my experience of the flower was enhanced way beyond anything i would have imagined you know so that's kind of how it can be hmm. how has it changed your perception of this reality that we're experiencing has it changed your perception and if so how i think it has led to me seeing everything is interconnected possibly that everything is even non-dual that everything is one but but definitely everything is interconnected that there's this relationship between everything and that i guess seeing other life as me in a sense not seeing this sort of division between um other animals plants the the natural world all of that kind of thing seeing myself as an interconnected part of that whole rather than something separate that enacts upon those things so i think that's the biggest sort of shift i would say in terms of how i see the world around me i guess seeing that underlying essence and core to everything that sort of connects back to me mm. yeah that's that's fascinating would you say that that is I hate to use the word God, but would you say that that's the source that we're all connected to? I mean, I think that's a completely valid way to interpret that. Yeah, I'm not sure I would. Yeah, I don't think I would use the word God with it. I, I guess I, I tend to like the idea of maybe this this consciousness or this expanded um, consciousness, and, it, and and that everything has a degree of consciousness or something like that. But I'm I'm less convinced by the idea of a sort of creator that intentionally did everything i do tend to feel that it's more of a that simplicity develops into complexity rather than complexity creates complexity which would be the god way of mm. doing things um mm. for me it makes more sense to look at things as they start as something very, very singular and very small, and then they expand into something else and then eventually return to that singular thing. So maybe that's sort of how I see it, the sort of oneness idea. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And for anyone that's that's watching this that is very interested in out-of-body experiences, how can someone get into this? Well, obviously, my materials, I've I've got a very in-depth course that's, and that's, obviously the books as well um will give people a, an intro and all that kind of thing as well and i also have sound technology that's designed to induce the vibrational state that's right and so i, I was reading about that what is that called and where, where can people find that it's called infraliminal sound basically they can find it on my website which is grahamnichols.com so I started working with frequencies and frequency patterns to try and develop something which would initiate the vibrational state. The vibrational state is the most common starting point for an out-body experience. So that's what I focused on. And, and so my infraliminal one track is designed, the vibrational track is designed for that. And then I have another track that is designed for people who do it via sleep and dreaming and that kind of approach. So there's two different, and that's that one's called the deep mind version. So, but the vibrational state one is called infraliminal one, and they're both on my website, mm. and you can get them with the course as well. Mm. And is there anything to watch out for if someone does have an out of body experience? Is there anything that is dangerous or anything that someone needs to watch out for? I don't believe so. No, I I, I think the only thing. That I would say to watch out for is probably not to learn via sleep paralysis. You do hear some scary stories, and I think the scary stories are normally related to what's called sleep paralysis, which is not an hour body experience. It's a it's a state where you wake up and you can't move, and people will often experience something like a dark shadow, or they'll they'll see figures or maybe a crone like an old woman or an old man or things like that and they get very scared by that it still can't hurt you but people will find it very scary so i would 
generally recommend if you want to learn to have out of body experiences, avoid methods that use sleep paralysis because I just don't think it's a very positive way to learn really. So there are people out there that think that they have all the answers to everything, whether they are very religious or very spiritual, that they know exactly everything that that happens. And then there are people on the science end of it as well who believe that they know everything. So what do you say to to people that believe they know all of the answers to all of this? <laughs> I think that it's it, it's a very irrational position to take because if you think about we're all human beings. We all have a very limited amount of perception and, and experience. You know, we're only here for a short period of time. We've only encountered a certain amount of things in our lives. The science um, that we have is not complete. We don't know everything that's out there yet. You know, no matter what religious framework someone comes from, there's always problems and issues with within the religious belief systems. There's always something that's contradictory or moral teachings that are not very nice, you know, these kinds of things. So so whatever so I think we need to have humility that, you know, no no one has all the answers. I, I think one of the spiritual ideas that is really useful is the Zen idea of the beginner's mind. So Shen, this idea of experiencing everything as if you're experiencing it for the first time and trying to approach life in that way where you encounter something and instead of just going to your default position, try to try to encounter it as if you're you're encountering it for the first time. Because that's the only way we learn and grow. If you are committed to a particular viewpoint then you're not going to be able to learn and experience new things and see if there's maybe something more to life than you originally thought there was. So I think it's really important to sort of take that position and have a sort of degree of humility that we don't have all the answers and we, and we don't know everything. That would be my angle on on that kind of thing. And, and a scientist that believes they know everything, that's definitely amusing because it's sort of it, it's so irrational you know and science is supposed to be rational you brought up a lot of things but it's it's very very fascinating so there's anything else you wanted to say before we sign off i mean the only thing we didn't touch upon that might be interesting for people is the sort of immersive art and things that i've also done in the past i built structures to help induce out of body experiences and altered states of consciousness so using hypnosis and also a, a virtual reality installation that I built at the Science Museum in London in 2004. So I've done some things like that as well, creating immersive total experiences um, based upon my experiences or based upon trying to induce the experiences. So well, it's very, very fascinating. So Graham, thank you so much for your time. We will put links to your books below. Navigating the out-of-body experience and avenues of the human spirit. We will put links to those below as well as your website. Everyone go ahead and check that out. But Graham, thank you so much for your time. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. It's a very, very fascinating um, conversation and it's it's a privilege and honor to meet you. You're very welcome. So that was my interview with Graham Nichols. If you like this interview, go ahead and hit the like button. And let me know in the comments, what do you think of this interview? And have you ever had an out-of-body experience? What are your thoughts on this topic? I love checking out your comments. If you want to see more interviews like this one, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when they come out. As always, thank you so much for watching. And thank you for your support.